commercial that I can get out of the way. Um, one is America's God and Country. It's an encyclopedia of God and Country quotes. And so it's got Abigail Adams at the front and Lincoln Jefferson, William Penn, George Washington at the back. And then a, um, uh, another book called Backfired. I read through every charter of every colony and found that each colony was founded by a different Christian denomination. Virginia was Anglican from 1606 to 1786. Massachusetts was Puritan. Rhode Island was Baptist. New York was Dutch Reformed. Delaware and New Jersey were originally Swedish Lutheran. Maryland was founded by Catholics, uh, then Pennsylvania by Quakers, Connecticut and New Hampshire by Congregationalists. You could go on and guess what? They didn't get along. They would chase each other out of each other's colonies. You know the Puritans not only hung witches, 19 of them, they hung Quakers. It was not until the Revolutionary War started that they had to work together against the King of England. After the Revolution, their attitude was, we may not agree on religion all the time, but you were willing to fight and die for my freedom. I need to let you practice your faith, right? And so Christians began to tolerate each other. So I read through every state constitution and every amendment and found that between 1776 and 1790, nine state constitutions required you to be a Protestant Christian to hold state office. Three were a little more liberal, saying all you had to do was be a plain Christian, like Maryland, uh, and then Delaware said all you had to do was believe in the Trinity. Uh, ben Franklin signed Pennsylvania's constitution that said all you had to do was believe in the divine inspiration of the Old and New Testament. The most liberal state was the most evangelical, Rhode Island, founded by Baptists. They had zero religious requirements to hold state office. They thought that if you required someone to be a Christian to hold office, they could say they were just to get elected, and that would be hypocritical and not pleasing to God. Could you imagine someone saying they're Christian just to get elected? <laughs> anyway, so then there was an Irish potato famine and the Catholic population exploded. Did you know that originally Catholics were only allowed in three colonies? In um, New York, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. And they didn't have full rights in those. There were only seven synagogues in the whole country. Only 1,500 Jews in a country of three million people. And so it was a predominantly Protestant, but a 100% Judeo-Christian country. But then the Irish potato famine happened. Millions of Irish Catholics came to America. They ended up getting tolerated. Then there was a persecution in Jews in Bavaria. They came over, ended up being tolerated. Uh, and then after the Civil War, many states rewrote their constitutions to say all you got to do is believe in God. And then finally, tolerance went out to the atheists. And the last ones in the boat decided it was too crowded, and they decided to push the first ones out. So it's backfired, the title of the book. So everybody's tolerated in America except the Christians that founded the country. Did you find that interesting? How many of you knew all that? All right. Anyway, uh, Pastor Gino did. Um, this is uh, a book that I did with my wife. She heard me speak for 30 years, and she said um, uh, that she wanted to pick out the best stories. And the best stories, by her definition, was there's a crisis, they prayed, and things turned around. Right? And so uh, the title of the book is Miracles in American History. And uh, a little background. So, uh, writing was invented around 3300 BC. Uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets, later the Chinese pictographs, which turned into the Chinese characters. And if you think of it, 3000 BC, let's round it out to 4000. Uh, 4000 BC, 2080 is 6000 years of recorded human history, right? Writing was invented, right? So they didn't have any human beings writing down human records because they hadn't invented writing yet. So there's 6,000 years of recorded human history. And in a sense, 6,000 years is not that long. It's only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years or close to it? Maybe a grandma. We're talking 60 grandmothers and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. So it's not that long, but it's been a 6,000 year quest to rule the world. And so I spent several years researching every civilization that's ever existed on the planet and found some unique things. Uh, Daniel Webster said, miracles do not cluster and what has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the constitution for if the American constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. He thought something really unique happened here. James Wilson signed the Declaration and the Constitution and was put on the Supreme Court by George Washington. He said, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance 
of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they and their posterity should live. He thought something really special happened here. Well, during this 6,000 years, empires have risen and empires have fallen. Empires have risen, empires have fallen. But we keep seeing that one thing keeps repeating itself. Power concentrates into the hands of one person. Right? I believe it goes back to the fall in the garden, Cain killing Abel. We call this one person by different names. Caesar, Caliph, Chairman, Chieftain, Communist, Dictator, Tsar, Despot, Day, Dodge, Emir, Grand, Mughal, Kaiser, Khan, King, Maharaja, Shogun, Sheik. The name changes, but the function remains the same. One person ends up with life and death power over everyone in their kingdom. And it's, it's inevitable. It's like a pull of a magnet, law of gravity. Uh, remember the Lord of the Rings? Always remember Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. And again, I believe it's selfishness that's in the human DNA that went all the way back to the fall in the garden. And then Cain killing Abel and one king taking a kingdom from another king. And so you put some babies in a crib, one of them will take the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one of them will be the bully hogging the ball. Put some natives in the woods, one of them is the Indian chief, and put some people in the inner city, one of them is the gang leader. And all the king is is a glorified gang leader in a sense. And so it's what's called the patronage system, where if you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you are an enemy of the king, you are dead. It's called treason. So for most of world history, equality was how close of an orbit can you get to the king? And so we see as time goes on, these kingdoms keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? So you have Sargon of Acadia, who conquered from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And then you had the Elamites, which turned into Persia. And then the uh, 2,000 years of uh, Egyptian pharaohs. And then you had uh, Cyrus of Persia, Darius. And then you had Alexander the Great. That conquered. And each time these empires keep getting bigger and bigger. And then you got the Roman emperors and the Indian Maharajas. And there's 5,000 years of Chinese emperors in, in 18 different dynasties. And then you have uh, the Byzantine emperors and the Muslim sultans and then the king of Spain, France, and Austria. No matter where you go in the world, these kingdoms keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, all controlled by one person. Calvin Coolidge said, the history of government on this earth has been almost entirely rule of force held in the hands of a few. Under our Constitution, America committed itself to power in the hands of the people. So the default setting is monarchy, right? You buy a computer, it's got default settings. You have humans, their default setting is power is going to want to concentrate into a gang leader. And so we see this history of the world. But the most powerful king in world history was the king of England. The British Empire controlled 13 million square miles and a half a billion people. The sun never set on the British Empire. They controlled all of India, a quarter of the world's population right there. Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, countries in Africa from Egypt, Kenya down to South Africa. They um, had uh, British Guyana and then Jamaica and the Bahamas. They had uh, Canada and then for a while they had the Americas. And so America decides that we're going to break away from this most powerful king that the planet had ever seen, and we have no navy and no army, just people that have faith and courage. And so we're going to pick up with the story. There's a lot more in my books, uh, but I don't have, I'm going to just skip into the story. So here we are. 1776. Washington is in New York, George Washington, and the harbor fills up with the largest invasion force in world history. There is uh, 32,000 British troops on 400 ships. The thousands of wooden masts in the New York Harbor looked like a forest of trees. And so the Continental Congress had declared a day of fasting. It says, we earnestly recommend the 17th of May be observed as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer, that we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease God's righteous displeasure, and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, obtain pardon and forgiveness. This is just a little over two months before they do the Declaration of Independence, and they're mentioning through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. George Washington gets this proclamation of fasting. He turns to his troops and gives an order. 
The Continental Congress, having ordered the 17th instant to be observed as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, humbly to supplicate the mercy of Almighty God, that it would please him to pardon our manifold sins and transgressions, the general commands all officers and soldiers to pay strict obedience to the orders of the Continental Congress, that by their unfeigned and pious observation of their religious duties, they may incline the Lord and giver of arms to prosper our arms. Giver of victory. Uh, Washington writes to his younger brother, we expect a very bloody summer of it at New York. We are not either in men or arms prepared for it. If our cause is just, as I most religiously believe it to be, the same providence which has in many instances appeared for us will still go on to afford us its aid. Well, they rush a copy of the Declaration out to Washington, and he has it read to his troops, July 9th of 1776. Did you know that Declaration of Independence mentions God four times? Laws of nature and of nature's God. All men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. You know the one line there, the second, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That is the most revolutionary political statement in world's history. Because for most of world's history, the world's rule, ruled by kings. And it's this divine right of kings where it's God gives his power to the king and he dispenses it as God's lieutenant to the people. That phrase says God gives the rights directly to the people. And so we see that for most of the world's history, you had the scenario creator, king, people. America's founder said, no, no, no. We get our rights directly from the creator. Every person gets them. And we just choose our leaders from amongst themselves. By the way, do you know the first nation to attempt to rule itself without a king was Israel? When they came out of Egypt around 1500 BC, for the first 400 years, no king. Everyone was equal before the law. And the law said there's no respect of persons in judgment. Rich or poor, they're all treated the same. Male, female, made in the image of the creator. Even the stranger living amongst you is under the same law that you're under. You compare that to the Islamic dhimmi status, Sharia law, where the stranger is a person with no rights whatsoever. I mean, look what's happening in Iraq right now. And so where they're killing, God have mercy on those Christians over there. You know, I mean, uh, we need to pray. Um, so our founding fathers, America was this experiment and it's a sliding scale of virtue. So for a people to rule themselves with no king, the people need lots of virtue. Uh, Franklin said only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. But as people give up their virtue and give into their passions and lusts, there's more crime. And then they say, government, uh, restore order because of all this crime. And power concentrates. And Lord Acton said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So we see this trend where if we're going to rule ourselves without a king, we have to be like Israel where the priests are teaching the law. But as the priests stopped teaching the law, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And they ended up having all kinds of sodomites surrounding houses and concubines being raped and Eli's own son sleeping with women in the tabernacle of meeting. And the people go to Samuel and, and they say, we want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. And Samuel cries and the Lord said, they did not reject you. They rejected me. God's perfect plan for Israel was to not have a king, have everyone be equal before the law, everyone be prosperous and, and the priest teaching them the system. And of course, uh, when they got King Saul, it was more of a punishment. Samuel said, this king, you know what he's going to do? He's going to take your land and give it to his favorites. Wealth redistribution. He's going to take your sons and make them run before the chariots and women be the cooks. And the, he's going to determine the fate of your children's lives. Anyway, so America is sort of a hybrid. We drew things from these experiments in the past. Israel, uh, Athens, the idea of a democracy, Rome, the idea of a republic, and I get it into all that, that basically re represent, a democracy is everybody every day has to go to the market and talk politics. A republic is you take care of your family and your farm, and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day and talks politics. They're your representative. Now in Rome, the representatives were hereditary, not elected. So we do this little hybrid in America where we democratically elect our representatives. And then we get the idea that these representatives can't do just anything they want. They're limited by something called a constitution, and there's a whole history of those. So anyway, so back to uh, America and our experiment. New York, 1776. 
The harbor is filled up with British ships. A loyalist, now a loyalist is someone who lives in America, but they're loyal to the King of England. And it was hard for us to picture that you could actually have someone living in America that's not loyal to America. Sort of strange thought. Anyway, so this loyalist led 10,000 British troops through Jamaica Pass, and they attacked George Washington from behind on August 27th, 1776. This is the largest battle of the entire Revolutionary War, and this is the entire American army. So there's no second army that can come to their rescue. 3,000 Americans die, only 300 British. Uh, Washington watched the 400 soldiers of his 1st Maryland Regiment. These young guys charged six times directly into the British lines, and just about all of them died, but it allowed the rest of the army to find cover. Washington exclaimed, good God, what brave fellows I have lost this day. Anyway, so they fight all day. By the end of the day, Washington is now pinned up against the water with the 400 ships behind him and these 10,000 troops coming down his throat. And so the next day, Washington will probably be hung and America will be another British colony like Kenya or India. But Washington has an idea. He's going to get every boat he can find and ferry his troops across the East River to Manhattan Island. And they're doing, carrying the horses and the cannons and the supplies. And then the sun starts coming up and they're in trouble because only half of his army has been moved across. And the ones that are left are not in a position to fight. So it really is vulnerable now. But Washington's chief of intelligence, Major Ben Talmadge, writes, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise off the river, and it seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well, and so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. Well, Washington was on the last boat that left, and when the fog lifted, the British charged, and no one was there. This was the last chance they had to capture the entire American army all at once. Washington later writes, The hand of Providence has been so conspicuous in all this, the course of the war, that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. So after I'm done being a general, then I can be the preacher. Um, then there's some more battles. They, they get chased out of New York, across New Jersey, across the Delaware, and now six months have gone by. He's in Pennsylvania. It's freezing cold. His 20,000 troops have dwindled down to 2,000, and they only volunteered for six months. So July, December, six, they're about to leave. Now he's in trouble again. And so he, um, uh, the Continental Congress gives instructions. They flee Philadelphia because the British are about to attack Philadelphia. And so their last memo to Washington was, uh, until Congress other, shall otherwise order, General Washington shall be possessed of full power to order and direct all things. In other words, they flee and they tell Washington, uh, you're in charge of America, you know, don't, don't forget to turn the lights out when you, when you leave. And, and they leave. And so Washington, the entire experiment of our country's independence is resting on George Washington's shoulder. And so... He has Thomas Paine's common sense uh, American crisis read to his troops. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. He goes on, heaven knows how to put a proper price on its goods and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Well, Washington, Christmas Day evening, 1776, crosses the Delaware in the dark. It's a blizzard. Some of his men freeze to death. He attacks the German Hessian troops at Trenton. These are mercenaries. They're hired killers. They're just, vicious. They're just terrible. Uh, they're a killing machine. And so Washington surprises them, attacks, and captures a 1,000 and lets them go. He, brings them, he captures these German Hessians, takes them across the river, and says, if you promise not to raise arms against America, I'll let you go. They promise, he lets them go. You compare that to the British. When they captured Americans, 
they stuck them in prisons. When they filled up, they turned churches into prisons. When they filled up, they turned ships into prisons. More Americans died on British starving ships than died in battle. I mean, just brutal. And um, anyway, so now Washington won the Battle of Trenton. The British send Cornwallis and reinforcements, and they're at Princeton, New Jersey. And Washington leaves his campfires burning, has a couple men in camp to cling pots and pans, and he marches his entire army all the way around to the other side of Princeton. And in the morning, the British charge into an empty camp. Washington attacks from behind. And as he's winning, the British turn and some of the Americans get scared and they start to run away. Washington's not about to give up this victory. He rides his horse to where the men are and yells at them to follow him. He rides within 30 yards of the British. He turns and faces his men and says, fire. They fire past Washington at the British. The British return the volley. Here he is in the middle of the field. Everybody's like, he's certainly dead. But when the smoke clears, they see Washington waving his coat saying, charge. <laughs> so they charge and they capture 800 more of the British. This amazing victory. And uh, Ezra Stiles was the president of Yale. And he said, in our lowest and most dangerous state in 1776 and 1777, we sustained ourselves against the British army of 60,000 troops commanded by the ablest generals Britain could procure throughout Europe with a naval force of 22,000 seamen and above 80 men of war. Who but a Washington, inspired by heaven, could have conceived the surprise move upon the enemy at Princeton or that Christmas Eve when Washington and his army crossed the Delaware the United States are under peculiar obligations to become a holy people unto the Lord our God. Then there's the Battle of Saratoga. Uh, the British had an army of 6,000 landed in Canada, and they're marching through New York. And the British, is this interesting? Am I keeping everybody's attention here? Um, the British general named Johnny Burgoyne, he made a deal with the Indians to do terrorist attack. I mean, here's the government giving guns to kill people. I know that's hard for us to imagine. And um, so uh, the Indians didn't know the difference between a white person who is a loyalist to Britain and a white person who is a patriot of America, right? And so uh, they would go out and terrorize and come in at night with their scalps. And there's the story of David Jones who lived in a New York settlement and was engaged to a girl named Jane McRae. And he kisses her goodbye, and he goes and joins British General Johnny Burgoyne. You can imagine him saying, we'll be back in a few weeks, and we'll rid this country of these rebels, and then we can get married, and blah, blah, blah. Well, one night, the Indians come into the British camp, and they're hooping and hollering, and they have all their scalps, and... One of the scalps is this long, beautiful hair that David Jones recognizes as his fiancée, Jane McRae's. Yes, they killed her and scalped her. And this caused such an uproar in the camp that they pressured this British general, Johnny Burgoyne, to tell the Indians to tone it down. Now, the Indians only knew on and off. They're at peace or they're at war. They don't know any of this limited warfare stuff. And they get offended and leave Burgoyne in the middle of the New York forest and he doesn't know where he's at. The Indians were his eyes and the ears. He's just sort of dumbfounded. The Americans surround him and forces him to surrender. 6,000 British troops surrender. This victory was so great that um, the painting of this is in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Anyway, Washington writes his brother, I most devoutly congratulate my country and every well-wisher on this cause to the signal stroke of providence. Continental Congress is so happy at the victory at the Battle of Saratoga, they issue the first day of Thanksgiving issued after the Declaration. So in a sense, this could be the first national day of Thanksgiving. It says, with one heart and one voice, join the penitent confession of their manifold sins that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ, mercifully to forgive and blot them out, and under the providence of Almighty God, secure for these United States the greatest of all human blessings, independence, and peace. So after this great victory, day of Thanksgiving, what do they happen to mention in there? Through the merits of Jesus Christ. 
So I thought they were all a bunch of deists and atheists. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Valley Forge. Uh, so after the British capture Philadelphia, Washington has to live in the, the woods. Uh, it's just a day's march from Philadelphia. It gets freezing cold. Lots of his men die. Washington gives an order to his troops. The commander-in-chief directs that divine service be performed every Sunday. To the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. Anyway, there were two types of pastors at the time. The Calvinist pastors said, God has a plan for your life, for your marriage, for your family, for your church, and for your country, and it's your job to find God's plan and enact it. Then there was the pietists. Now, in Europe, when Martin Luther had his uh, understanding that just shall live by faith, it was a personal revelation to Martin Luther. But some princes wanted to break away <clears throat> from the Roman Catholic Church, and so they decided, you know what, my whole kingdom, guess what, everybody, you're Lutheran. And so to the people in the kingdom, it was not a personal revelation, it was the king deciding for them. Now, agreed, there was more emphasis on the scripture, but over the time, it turned into this intellectual assent to some Orthodox Lutheran doctrine, but the people had not had a heart change. And a revival movement swept through these German Lutheran churches, and it was called Pietism. And it said, look, it's more than just an ascent to a bunch of doctrines. It's a real heart experience with Jesus. And as this spread, the thought was, well, if you really have Jesus in your heart, your life's going to change. You're not going to enjoy the things you used to enjoy. You're not going to go to the bars and the brothels and the theaters, and you're not going get to get involved in worldly things like government. <laughs> so here they had this heartfelt change, and their desire was to pull back from everything, including getting involved in government. So you had pastors saying, look, you just have this personal relationship with God. Don't get involved in the world. All right, this ultimate expression was in the Mennonites and then eventually, you know, the, the Amish that says, we're not even going to vote, you know. And um, so why is this story applicable here? applicable here? Well, at Valley Forge was a Lutheran minister that was a pietist. And he actually met, you know, uh, Ludwig von Zinzendorf who came to Pennsylvania and helped found Pe Bethlehem, Pennsylvania on Christmas Eve. And so this Lutheran pietist pastor named Henry Mullenberg had two sons who were pastors. One was John Peter Mullenberg, who uh, had to get licenses as an Anglican pastor to be able to be a Lutheran pastor in Virginia, because Virginia was an Anglican colony. And he hears Patrick Henry's speech, the give me liberty, give me death speech. He's inspired. He goes to George Washington and says, I want to enlist. And Washington says, fine, you're a colonel, go find your men. <laughs> So he goes to his church, and he preaches a sermon. There's a time for all things, Ecclesiastes, a time to gather stones, a time to scatter stones. He goes, a time to preach, and a time to fight. And he takes off his clerical robe, and underneath is the uniform of a continental officer. He has an altar call, and his, the men, 300, come forward. They kiss their wives goodbye. They ride off that afternoon, and they become the 8th Virginia Regiment. And they fight in all these different battles, even Yorktown. He gets promoted to general after the war, he becomes a congressman and then a U.S. senator, and he was so influential that the state of Pennsylvania put his statue in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall, John Peter Mullenberg. And the statue that's in the Capitol is him with his robe off, and you can see the uniform, and he's got the Bible. Well, John Peter obviously had adopted this Calvinist view, like God has a plan, we got to get involved and enact it. He had a brother that was of the pietist and his name was Frederick Mullenberg. He pastored in New York. And Frederick writes letters to John Peter saying, you're getting involved in things that pastors aren't supposed to be involved in. You're not supposed to talk about politics. You're not supposed to talk about the, the government and all this kind of stuff in the church. And then the British burnt Frederick Mullenberg's church. And Frederick Mullenberg's changes his tune and says, well, maybe we, we need to get involved a little bit. Frederick Mullenberg goes on and becomes a U.S. congressman, and he becomes the first Speaker of the House. And there's one signature on the Bill of Rights when it passed the House, and it's Frederick Mullenberg's signature. Do you honestly think he would sign a Bill of Rights with the First Amendment to outlaw him and his brother and his dad's church and faith in God? No, the First Amendment was to keep the federal government's hands tied so they wouldn't get involved in the church and state business because religion was under state's jurisdiction. Anyway, 
So we have uh, the father is Henry Mullenberg. He wrote the notebook of a colonial clergyman. He was there at Valley Forge. He says, I heard a fine example today, namely that His Excellency George Washington wrote among his army yesterday and admonished each to fear God, to put away wickedness, and to practice Christian virtues. Anyway, so another miracle. Benedict Arnold, who had been a general, and he was put in charge of West Point. Is this still interesting? Am I keeping everybody's attention? Okay. Um, Benedict Arnold was in charge of West Point. For those not familiar with the geography of New York, West Point is on the Hudson River. The Hudson River goes north and south, cutting New York in half, cutting America in half, with New England colonies on one side, middle southern colonies on the other. So if you can control West Point, you can control the Hudson River, and you can control America. And in addition to that, um, George Washington was planning on visiting West Point the very day that Benedict Arnold was going to betray. So the story of Benedict Arnold, he had been a hero of the Battle of Saratoga. Remember the Jane McRae story and the scalp and everything? So Benedict Arnold was a hero of that, but his wife felt like the Americans did not appreciate her husband. And she kept nagging him and nagging him till finally she put him in touch with a British spy named John Andre. And so Benedict Arnold meets with the British spy and gives him a map of West Point because Benedict Arnold is in charge of West Point. The spy leaves dressed as a civilian, walking through the woods. Some American guards hear him, capture him, and try to say, well, what are you doing in the woods? And he says, oh, you know, I'm just out for a walk. And they don't believe him, so they search him once, twice. The third time, they make him take off his boot, and in the heel of his boot, they find the map of West Point. And so here's the picture of him with his boot off and they hold the map there. What do they do but decide to march him back into Benedict Arnold's office? Like, we caught this guy about to betray your fort. Did, did you know that? Anyway, Benedict Arnold hears they're coming. He flees on a ship called the Vulture. That was the British ship's name. And he joins the British and later attacks and kills Americans. I mean, he really sold out. Washington offered to trade John Andre the spy in exchange to get Benedict Arnold back. The British say no, so we hang John Andre the spy. Washington writes, treason of the blackest dye was yesterday discovered. General Arnold, who commanded at West Point, was about to give the American cause a deadly wound, if not fatal stab. Happily, the treason had been timely discovered to prevent the fatal misfortune. The providential train of circumstances which led to its discovery affords the most convincing proof that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. Ezra Stiles says, uh, he was president of Yale, a providential miracle at the last minute detected the treacherous scheme of traitor Benedict Arnold which would have delivered the American army, including George Washington himself, into the hands of the enemy. Congress decides to have another day of Thanksgiving, and it says, the late remarkable interposition of his watchful providence in the rescuing of the person of our commander-in-chief and the army from imminent dangers at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. It is therefore recommended a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to confess our unworthiness and to offer fervent supplications to the God of all grace to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. I mean, I'm just sort of taken back. Here they are thanking God that Washington's delivered and they just happen to put in there and to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. These men were Christian men that helped give our country's independence. And then the battle of cow pens. You have some cows, you put them in a pen, you call the place cow pens. Uh, have you seen the movie The Patriot that Mel Gibson did? Toward the end, there is a battle scene that is the battle of cow pens. The American general, Daniel Morgan, has some ragtag American militia who are known for fighting and running away. He begs them for three shots before they run away over the hill. On the other side of the hill is a river. Now, you never fight a battle with a river behind you because if you're losing, it makes it difficult to retreat. And so along comes the British Colonel Tarleton, known as the butcher, because he would kill people that were disarmed and everything, and he'd kill those that surrendered. And so, Colonel Tarleton the butcher has his dragoons. These are these soldiers on these big, fast horses with their razor blade swords. You can't outrun them. I mean, they are the fastest thing on the battlefield. They're like an F-16, I mean. And so they start charging. 
and the Americans fire once, boom, and the British are charging. The Americans fire twice, boom, and the British keep charging. The Americans fire a third time and then run over the hill. By this time, the British are at a full gallop and they just can't stop. They just fly over the hill only to be met at point blank range by 400 American Continental soldiers that are battle hardened, that are tough, and they fire, boom, and 100 British fall dead, 800 of them throw down their arms and surrender. Colonel Tarleton rides away really fast. And so this is the victory of the Battle of Cowpens, a strategic turning point in the revolution. Well, Daniel Morgan decides not to stand around and celebrate, he hightails it out of there. And so he takes the 800 he captured and he's riding back to Virginia. And as he's riding, the British give chase with British Cornwallis ch chasing them, saying, I'm not about to let these rebels take my ed ed dragoons. And, and so they get to the Catawba River. The Americans cross. The British show up two hours later. But before they can start crossing, there is a flash flood. The river rises and the British have to wait a day. That happens again at the Yadkin River. And Cornwallis is trashing his supplies, trashing his heavy wagons, his food supplies and everything. And he's chasing, chasing, chasing. They get to the Yadkin River. And there's the red coats or the red line and the blues. And the Americans cross. An hour later, the British show up. But before they can start crossing, another flash flood. The rivers rise. They have to wait a day. It happens again at the Dan River. The, the British show up at one o'clock at night and they're looking across and seeing the Americans get out the other side. But before they can start crossing, another flash flood and the British are stopped. The British commander, Henry Clinton, wrote, here the royal army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen almost miraculously to let the enemy over, who could not else have eluded Lord Cornwallis's grasp, so close was he at their rear. And so Washington says, we have abundant reasons to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions in our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence for all other resources seem to have failed us. And the, now Cornwallis, he's got his army, but no supplies because he trashed them when he was in the hurry chasing. And so Cornwallis is ordered to wait at Yorktown for the British ships to bring him more supplies. The French finally show up with Louis XVI's Navy and they block the British and the Americans force Cornwallis to surrender. And Washington says, to diffuse the general joy through every breast, the general orders divine service to be performed tomorrow in the several brigades. The co commander in chief earnestly recommends troops not on duty should universally attend with that gratitude of heart, which the recognition of such astonishing interposition of providence demands. John Jay, the first chief justice said, this glorious revolution is marked, is, is distinguished by so many marks of divine favor and interposition that no doubt can remain of it being supported in a manner so singular and I may say miraculous that when future ages shall read its history, they will be tempted to consider a great part of it as fabulous, as made up. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, America appears like a last effort of divine providence in behalf of the human race. And Washington again writes, and he says, it will not be believed that such a force as Great Britain has employed for eight years in this country could be baffled in their plans of subjugating it by numbers infinitely less, composed of men oftentimes half starved, always in rags, without pay, and experience at times every species of distress which human nature is capable of undergoing. He said, the singular interpositions of providence in our feeble conditions were such as could scarcely escape the attention of the most unobserving, while the perseverance of the armies of the United States through almost every possible suffering and discouragement for the space of eight long years was little short of a standing miracle. And then Franklin, when they're writing the Constitution in 1787, he says, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instance of a superintending providence in our favor. The war ends, and do you know the Treaty of Paris that ended the revolution starts off in the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity? And Ronald Reagan said, in 1775, the Continental Congress proclaimed the first national day of prayer. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris officially ended the long, weary Revolutionary War during which a national day of prayer had been proclaimed every spring for eight years. And I love this quote. 
This is from the journals of the U.S. House of Representatives, March 27, 1854. James Meacham, a congressman, said this, down to the revolution, every colony did sustain religion in some form. It was deemed peculiarly proper that the religion of liberty should be upheld by a free people. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. In other words, if you would have told these guys that, hey, yeah, you know what, you're starting a country that uh, someday is going to tell kids they can't say Jesus at a graduation and tell chaplains in the military that they can't say Jesus when they're saying a prayer and that they're going to kick God out of the schools. And if you were to tell them that, he says, that revolution would have been strangled in his cradle. These were Christian men, right? You look at the colonies, and every colony was started by different Christian denominations. They didn't want the federal government to pick one denomination, so they had a First Amendment limiting the federal government because religion was under state's jurisdiction. Anyway, and that's some of my different books. In the next service, I'm going to be taught, picking up from here and going to the French Revolution, the Barbary Pirates, and bringing it up to the present. But I wanted to say that these men were Christian. Now, in closing, I love the gospel, and I had been reading through the book of Genesis and the story of the fall. And if you look at it real slow, the gospel is there. So have you ever talked about somebody behind their back? Maybe lied or made fun of them or maybe you somebody you stole from. And then you're there talking and all of a sudden that person starts to walk down the hallway. Maybe like you're in a school or something. Question. Are you drawn to want to run over to that person and say hi? Or are you like, eh, they haven't seen me yet. There's a side hall. I'm just going to sort of slip away. Okay, how many? So when you sin against somebody, your own conscience does not allow you to want to come into their presence. It's sort of like magnets where the wrong side is faced. And no matter how hard you push them, it just wants to slide the other way. Your conscience does not. So when Adam and Eve sinned against God, their own conscience caused them to do what? run the other way and hide, and then they covered themselves with what? Fig leaves. The fig leaf is the invention of religion. It's the first church of works. This is man realizing that they're sinners and separated from God, and it's them wanting to work and try to make themselves acceptable to God's presence. And God showed up, what did he do? He made Adam and Eve coats of skins. Right? Coaches, you're familiar with the story. And so the question is, how do you make a coat of skins? Mm, I think something has to die. Do you think God went to the other side of the garden, killed some animals, and brought them some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever. And God is stripping the skin off of this animal. And they're thinking, we sin, but this innocent animal is dying in our place. And then God wanted to make it really clear, the symbolism. He takes these skins and he puts them on Adam and Eve. So they're constantly wearing this reminder that this animal died as a result of their sin. And with the skins on them, God says, okay, now we can have a relationship. It's going to be a 4,000-year plan of redemption, but now we can have a relationship. And so it was like really clear, your works, your fig leaves cannot make you acceptable in my presence. This innocent animal died and you're wearing that and it's because you're wearing that that we can, you can approach me. They have kids, Cain and Abel. Cain offers what when he wants to worship the Lord? The works of his hands, the, the, the grain from the field. And we know it's works because when Adam sinned, God said, the ground is cursed for your sake and you're going to bring forth fruit from the ground by the sweat of your brow. So Cain brought, so in other words, he had a branch off the church of the fig leaves and he started the church of the fruits and the nuts. <laughs> this was him saying, I'm, I'm, there is a God and I'm, I'm going to try to make myself acceptable to him by working really hard. And Abel did the coat of skin thing. Abel killed an animal, and God accepted it. And so we see this symbolism. It's so clear. God's on one side. Man's on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. 
and the lamb pays for the sin. It dies as our substitute and restores us to God. Does that make sense? And so we see through history that Abraham offered the lamb. Moses offered the lamb. Uh, Solomon offered a thousand of them. Finally, David uh, offers lambs. And then Elijah. And then finally, John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So Jesus is our Lamb. So are you going to approach God as Cain or Abel? Are you going to approach God and saying, I hope I work enough, I hope I'm good enough, I hope I'm going to try to do all these different things? Or are you going to approach saying, I am not worthy, I'm a sinner, but this Lamb, I'm going to put all my faith that this Lamb Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins. So that's the gospel. So um, um, someday you're going to be dead. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Sort of a nice, in inspiring thought to finish the service with. But you're going to be in heaven because you believe in the Lamb. And so when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun. I may have told this story here before, but imagine you're in heaven. It's been 10,000 years, and you're walking down the streets of gold, and you, and you meet Moses. That would be pretty neat. Maybe Moses will invite you over to his place. You know, Jesus said, my father's house are many mansions. I don't know what it's like up there, but I bet Moses will have a pretty nice place. He'll probably have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn out. Get it? The burning bush didn't burn up, and the logs in the fireplace aren't burning up. And um, one preacher said that he thinks that in heaven, you'll be able to travel as fast as you think. And I'll probably show up late. <laughs> My wife would say, where were you? I said, I was thinking about something else. And, but imagine being there in Moses' living room. Maybe he has a big living room like here today. And after all the small talk's over, you can't help it. You say, Moses, tell us the story again. I mean, I read the book and saw the movie. But here you are in person. And Moses stands up. The room's quiet. And he says, I was 80 years old. And Pharaoh, the most powerful leader in the world at the time, was charging in at us with these razor-sharp swords and these chariots. And, and I just stood there, trusting God, holding out my staff, saying, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. We're going to say, wow. Then we're going to look a few rows over, and there's David. Say, David, David, tell us your story. And he'll stand up and say, well, I was 17 years old, and this thug, Goliath, was mocking our God and making fun of our religion. And these grown-ups were too chicken to do anything. And I said, enough of that. I'm going to do something. And I took my little sling and hit him in the head and took his own sword and chopped his head off. And we're going to say, wow. And one by one, we're going to go around the room. Gideon's going to tell his story and Deborah and the Apostle Paul. And then everybody in the room is going to look at you. Say, you, we haven't heard your story yet. What did you do when it was your turn to be on earth? What were they saying about God in your country? Or the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb? Or, or marriage that God himself instituted in Genesis, right? Or, uh, or when pastor had a vision to reach out to the community. Tell us the, how the whole world was against you and how you stood up. Tell us how you were backstabbed by all your Christian friends and you were about to give up on it all, but you decided to keep your eyes on Jesus and trust in him like a little thread and then a rope and a cord. And finally the blessings of God came back. Tell us how, how you had faith when it looked hopeless, what are you going to say? I'd hate for any of us to be squirming in the seat saying, eh, can you call on somebody else? Let me think about this answer. But you know what? We're still on this earth. We still have breath in our lungs. We still have feet that try the stone. You can still do those things that you'll be known for forever. This is an exciting time to be alive. There's been crises in the past. Our leaders of our country have turned to God. We have crises today, and God is calling us to turn to him. And so this is out of the 6,000 years of history he's chose for you to be alive right now. You're his star player on the bench. He slapped you in the back saying, get in the game. You've been made for this. So greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so I am excited because the day will come when we'll be sitting around up in heaven and you'll get to share your story of how you 